Hello, everyone, and welcome to Placing Faces, the show where we sit down with some of the most influential casting directors in all of Hollywood and across the entertainment spectrum. I am your host, Charlie Chapel, and today we're going to be talking with Jeremy Gordon. Jeremy is one hardworking casting director. He is extremely accomplished as a casting director in his own right, but you can also catch him working as an associate with some of the biggest casting directors who ever lived. He has a talent for keeping himself busy, learning and growing with each new job, and working with great casting directors. He has a work ethic that makes him the perfect person to call on, which is exactly what Jane Jenkins does every time she comes out of retirement for a Rob Reiner film. Jeremy has worked on big shows and movies like Marvel's Cloak and Dagger, Shock and Awe, LBJ, We Bought a Zoo, V, and he's also worked on some really fantastic indie features like Obscure, Rust Creek, Twisted Blues, and the phenomenal Spork, which I cannot recommend highly enough. It is something different, which I think we could all probably use. But Jeremy sells it a whole lot better than I can, so I'm going to let him do the talking. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We had a really great time recording it, so listen up, and I hope that you learn as much as I did. Well, thank you again for having us in your home today. Absolutely. Uh, really, really appreciate it, and I'm really stoked to talk with you. Uh, we were connected through... Corbin Bronson, who's yes. been on the podcast before, but oddly enough, right before he said, you should talk to this guy, I had watched Shock and Awe with my brother in Arkansas <laughs> like a week before I that. I think you're like the and 15th person to have seen the film. I don't think there were many people who watched it, unfortunately. I really liked it. Uh, it was just, it was interesting because we watched it and then I sat down as I've been doing a lot more lately and going, who cast that? And had written your name down and added it to the list That's so literally the week before Corbin <laughs> was like, hey, talk to this guy. That's great. Well, I'm glad you watched the film. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, they did not have a great distribution plan, so most people have not even heard of it. But it was a great film. only, what, 100 theaters 100 or something? 100 theaters for, I think it was two weeks. Yeah. It, it made no sense to me. No, it didn't... Uh, because I, I, I went after you had said all that of like because you you made that joke kind of of oh you were one of the few <laughs> who watched that I went and looked at the business side of it and I didn't see any like when the trailers released was like maybe a week out like there was there was very little release support very on that little uh, Rob Reiner and Woody Harrelson did somewhat of a press tour mm -hmm. more slanted toward the political press tour uh, but there wasn't a big thing there were not trailers on tv and people have not not just seen it but they haven't even heard of it <laughs> and that was the thing like we stumbled across it and there's james marsden and there's this incredible cast uh, the i posters mean right there yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's huge it cast. is a wonderful cast <laughs> and a really well-made movie that tells a story that honestly i didn't even really know about yeah most people don't know Night the story Ritter being pretty much the only like news resource who was actually paying attention to right. the bullshit. Right. And it's so timely today with yes, it is. politics and fake news. And Rob had been working on this film for, I don't know, the better part of a decade. Mm -hmm. So it's doubly confusing to me as to why there wasn't a huge wide release. And people I think would love this film and love the cast. And I think so too. It's a bummer. Well, well, we'll loop back around to that one. Um, but as, as we do with most of these, I think the best place to start is at the beginning. Where do you come from? And how did you get here? <laughs> I come from New York. Okay. From Brooklyn. Um, I always wanted to be an actor growing up. I went to Syracuse and I studied acting and I have a degree in acting for what that's worth. A degree in acting. A degree acting. in acting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I came out to LA in the 90s to be an actor. And I think I went on three auditions before I decided I absolutely do not want to be an actor. See, there, so there's another uh, interview that you did in 2015. Uh, it's on YouTube. We'll link to it in the show notes where you said that. And there was no follow up. And I have to follow up. Do yeah, you sure. do you remember what you auditioned for and why? Because three is three is it, like you barely set your toe in the water. What uh, I auditioned for a manager. Uh huh. Uh, and I do not remember what the other things were for. I'm sure nothing big, but it was just, it was instantly I could see that this was a life that I didn't want. And I, I think even at the end of college, I was like, I don't know about being in front of the camera. I don't think being in front of the camera was going to be my jam. 
uh, and at that time I was young and happy working at TGI or Fridays and making money and hanging out with my friends in the evening and thinking career was secondary, sure. <laughs> secondary to living, but I knew that I did not want to be an actor at that point. So I went to grad school for teaching. I have a master's in education. Mm-hmm. Uh, and like many people in my family, I was a school teacher. I taught first grade and then seventh grade. What did you teach in those two grades? First grade was... First every, grade is everything. like everything, right? Yeah. yeah. And then seventh grade was English and U.S. history, okay. which I have zero background in. <laughs> I was going to say, you know... <laughs> but there are textbooks. <laughs> um, and while I was teaching, uh, my at the time, my best friend, Joe Dane, and I... He was working for Full Moon Features as a line producer, and they make campy horror films. And we decided out of the blue to create a production company because everybody seemed to have a production company. And why not a producer and a teacher? So you were teaching here in L.A.? I was teaching here in L.A. Mm -hmm. And we, out of the gate, got a five-picture deal with Full Moon Features to produce with them. And I was given the job of casting director because there was no one else to do it. And they said, oh, you are an actor. You can be a casting director. Figure it out. So I was <laughs> casting films at night and on the weekends and having no idea what I was doing at all. While teaching a bunch of unruly seventh graders. That's right. <laughs> how to read and uh, <laughs> yes. who the president was. Uh, yeah, it was pretty 16. crazy. <laughs> but I loved it. And... I kept at it, doing both for about two years, and then decided I had to make a decision. Mm -hmm. So I went with casting. Okay. And I, so I literally fell into this. I did not start as an intern and then become an assistant and work my way up. I started as a casting director. Yeah. And then sort of backtracked a little bit, knowing I should go figure out how to really do this. So the first associate job I ever had was working for Michael Hawthorne. Yeah who said in the interview, are you sure you want to work for me? Because you're already a casting director. I said, yes, I need to learn how to do this outside of low-budge, non-union mm-hmm. horror films. Uh, and that, that started it all. Well, and that's been one of the most interesting aspects, I think, of, of researching your career, is looking at how much you have been a casting director in your own right, but you still work as a casting associate with some of the biggest casting directors in the world and of all time. Um, but it's still something that we don't see a whole lot. We don't see a whole lot of people who are casting directors who are still going back and working associate jobs and that sort yes. of thing. Um, look, for me, it's if I, if I could have a casting director only career right now, it would be great. Mm-hmm. But especially trying to break into TV and get my own series, that is a very difficult thing to do right now Mm -hmm. uh and i have no you sort of have to throw your ego aside with it and i'll go work with great casting directors who i want to know and and work with and learn from so that there's more on my resume for tv that will help me get there plus there's the whole union thing and i need my hours and every hour is towards my pension and so that's great uh, while I continue to cast independent films and, and uh, sort of try to build up that Things side that aren't of my quite career. union that may not be giving you the hours that you need. Exactly. Yeah. But we're close. You know, at some point in the next couple of years, hopefully the associate thing can go away for me. But I'm having a great time and I work with great people on mm-hmm. great projects. And Yeah, you do. It's, it's definitely helped me get to where I am. Yeah. So let's take a step back. I yeah. want to talk about some of these movies that you made very early on because <laughs> I didn't there are very few of them that are actually out there uh, to like rent but they're almost all the trailers are there and there's some wild shit in there man Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, some of the early stuff was like decadent evil and doll oh, graveyard yeah. and petrified <laughs> and dangerous worry dolls uh, if you guys get a chance Google Decadent Evil and watch that trailer. It is a trip. Those were the full moon features. Those are the campy horror films that were fun to make. I can only imagine they were a blast to make. Oh, yeah. And there's, there's from the outside, because everybody knows the genre of, like, campy B horror, C horror, like, really weird. I'm curious if it's approached with that in mind, or how seriously are you taking... Everybody knows that it's it's can't be horror films, mm-hmm. but 
at least for me in casting, especially, I'm not approaching it from that. I, it's a role like any other. And if we can amp up the cast and get mm -hmm. super talented actors, it's going to take it from a really campy horror film to this sort of cultish, great horror film with great acting. I mean, I, I really found the best actors and I've started some actors in their careers who were in these films for the first time, their first projects. So I really tried to find the great actors to sort of help elevate, maybe steer a little bit away from the campiness, but everybody knows what the films are and that's really okay. why people like these films in particular. Yeah. yeah. I'm also curious, what sort of things do you learn doing this type of thing, especially so early on in your career, and especially now that I'm finding out that you were just kind of thrown into it, <laughs> that that have kind of stuck with you through the years? Sure. Well, I was also lucky enough to be producing those films as well. Mm -hmm. So I was with them from casting, then on set every single all day. All the way through production. All the way through. So I really did learn a lot, uh, and I was able to see the actors that I cast work and sort of what works and Which what doesn't work. Which you don't get very often as a casting director. Get. I mean, yeah. you can visit a set for a minute, but you don't really get to spend the time. Uh, and I literally was thrown into both. I knew nothing about producing at that time as well. So thrown into the fire for both. Mm -hmm. But really getting to see what works and why doing something in casting affects this in production uh, really gave me that sort of full vision of of the whole production and I, it really did help and it still helps me today to think about these horror films that were less than a hundred grand all in for a budget shooting 16 pages a day <laughs> there's a lot to be said for learning how to make your penny work and learning how to make the days and why an unprepared actor who may be super talented and well known but unprepared can destroy, can destroy a day on a yeah. set I mean there's no time to to waste any time or, or why even on a low budget film, you need the experienced actor and not someone who's going to need a lot of hand holding. Otherwise, we'll never make our days. Mm -hmm. So really, it really opened my eyes to a lot of things on the production side. Yeah. Is there anybody from that era of, of work that you were doing that you kept in contact with, that you still work with, that you still think of for roles from time to time? Oh, sure. Uh, well, Joe Dane is... Uh, you know, he's a producer now, makes his own films, and still a very good friend of mine. Um, Hannah Marks. Hannah Marks. Who, uh, she was in Doll Graveyard. She was, I believe, 12, 10 at the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now she's repped on her untitled or somewhere big, and she does her own film. She's got directing credits, and she has really worked her way up. Okay. Um, just fantastic people. I have... Uh, actors who auditioned for me in these very first films that I will always bring back. Mm -hmm. Some of them were cast, some of them were not cast, but I always bring them back. There are so many actors from Full Moon Features that Charlie Band, the director and owner of the, owner of the company, started and mm -hmm. are now huge. I believe William Shatner and Helen Hunt and, and, and Viggo Morganson and people of that nature have all been in his films back in the day. Okay. And now we, you know, they're big, famous actors who we all know and love. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Um, so what are some of the traits you think coming from? Because being a teacher, I think, is also really fascinating. Um, one, it's a thankless job, <laughs> which casting is also a very yeah, thankless job. Good point. Um, and you see the gamut of personality, I think, as a teacher. More so than... Probably, I, I can't really think of any other like job or thing out there that gives you direct access to so many people who are so different. I'm curious what sort of things you bring from your experience as a teacher and the things that you use to like manage your world and life as a teacher into the casting world. Patience <laughs> would be a big <laughs> one. And that's something I don't have a lot of in my life just in general. Um, but just like you said, every, there's so many different personalities and types and, and ways of doing things and getting from point A to point B that in teaching, if I had 20, whatever students in my class, I had to get them all from point A to point B, but each of them's a different human who learns differently and needs to get there differently. And actors are very much the same way. We need 
them to be here with the character and and before we can bring them to the director we need them to be prepared and here and how do we get them there this actor is great with this kind of direction or cold read for a different role but then this actor needs something very different so looking at how different people are including the different directors and the different producers that i work with and different studios and the executives everybody is different and has a different way and we all have to get from here to there successfully but differently Mm -hmm. are there any like tips tricks or examples of how you as a casting director have utilized that mentality and that understanding in the casting room itself or is it more is this more of something that you're using in the conversations about the project itself and and helping kind of curb people's opinions towards a a certain actor sure i think in the casting room it's just me being open to every actor being different i can't just Hmm. give the same note or expect the same thing of each actor it's a different experience with every person and we're wanting the actors to come in and be their own individual person. So I have to be open to what they're giving me and be ready to give notes and directions and help them that's specific to that person. Mm -hmm. Now I could give this one note and see it's not registering, this is not working, but they're giving me something and they're so right for the role, so I have to change it up too. And you know, these are notes that we're just coming up with in the spur of a moment that we then expect the actor to Take and we give them no time to sort of process that and then give it back to us in the way that we're looking for. So we have to be open all the time to that. And I am constantly changing the way that I'm giving notes or thinking about how to help this actor. Mm-hmm. One other thing, and we'll, and we'll move into you know more of your work here in a second, but I also really find it fascinating going from being a teacher. You were also an EMT. <laughs> yes. How long were you an EMT? About 10 years, but that was simultaneously alongside other things. Okay. I started literally the first day I got to campus. I went to Syracuse. The first day I got to campus, I walked into the Syracuse University ambulance office and said, what's this? And they got me to sign up immediately. It's a... (laughs) You were they tricked into own, becoming an totally. EMT. They have <laughs> Same their as own EMS director. service for the whole <laughs> university. Uh-huh. Uh, s- student run, student everything. They had their own dispatch center and two ambulances and two non-emergency vehicles. And I said, well, this is, sounds interesting. And I, literally, I was volunteering with them for four years full time. And I was hitting 40 plus hours a week volunteering as an EMT and a dispatcher and I ran their 911 center on campus and did that full time while I was taking full credits and I was in the plays and the musicals, but it was the best thing that I have ever done. I think that has helped me more than anything, sort of become who I am and be able to handle the craziest situations that just happen and you have to be able to act and react super quickly. Uh, And I kept volunteering after college uh, back home on Long Island and Mm -hmm. uh, in Pittsburgh when I lived there and various other places. And I kept the EMT certification for as long as I could. And then I got out here and after some time of not really using it, just felt like it was time to let that go. Yeah. It was an amazing, uh, really, I think, shaped me more than anything else I've ever done. Well, I feel like in that role in society, you are seeing the worst of the worst. Yeah, in in their worst day ever, in their worst moments. How does that affect you as a human being, not just as like a cat, because we'll get to how does it affect you as a casting director and how can you bring that? And and most of like these questions are based in the idea of how do you bring everything to be something that you are doing now? But I'm curious, how does that affect you as a human being? How does that change the way you think about the world? Hopefully it helps me be more empathetic. Uh, There are so many things that happen to us that are far beyond our control, just like there are things that happen with actors that are far beyond their control. Uh, And we have to use that. We just have to go with it. This is what's happening in any given moment. And 
we have to adapt and we have to feel for other people and be willing to help them and go out of our way to help somebody. Uh, it really just opened my eyes to see all sorts of people needing all sorts of things, no matter what it is. And uh, I think it's made me a kinder, hopefully more helpful person. But that's definitely parlayed into absolutely everything that I've done. Uh, but it also helps me take control. I'm definitely a type A guy from New York, but I think... I hadn't noticed. <laughs> <laughs> being an EMT, you're in charge of people's lives. Yeah, and it's life and death. No, yes, life and death. And there's no time to pause. You just have to go and you have to be in charge and you have to make split second decisions that could affect somebody's life. And that definitely helps me with work. It also helps me realize that when we're casting, it's not life and death. This is mm -hmm. entertainment and oh, it's yeah. supposed to be fun and entertaining and that it's super important, but it's not life and death. And sometimes everyone just needs to take a deep breath and remember. Chill the fuck out. We're, we're casting, making movies. We're producing. <laughs> this is not, no one's going to die today yeah. from this process. Yeah. Well, I'm curious then to... With all of the craziness that you see in that kind of role, does it allow you, when you're in the casting office, to spot bullshit a little bit easier? <laughs> oh, that's a good question, because uh, there's a lot of bullshit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know if th that specifically is... Ha I think everything in my life has helped me be able to spot bullshit. I was a, a psych minor, along with my theater major. That helps. Uh, but I'm just, I don't know, I guess a lot of people are, but I'm a good bullshit spotter and I have zero patience for it in work or my life. There's no, I don't have enough time and energy for it. So yeah, I spot it pretty easily and I do like I to call New people York, out for it. Being like New Yorkers seem to have a much better <laughs> bullshit meter than yeah. anybody else in the country. I agree with that. <laughs> yeah, I'll definitely call, call <laughs> actors out on it, uh, because it, doesn't help the actor and then therefore mm -hmm. doesn't help us if we don't call them out on it if we because they just keep to, coming back and right yeah we need to feed them the correct true information so that it helps them more in this audition or their next audition for anybody and especially for me i want them to come back next time without that bs so that they can come back and just cut to the chase and let's not deal with these 12 excuses that mean absolutely nothing mm -hmm. Let's get to where we need to be. Yeah. Well, now let's take a little stroll into some of your work. And I think I want to start with Spork. Great. This movie is incredible. <laughs> um, I really, really enjoyed this movie. Awesome. And, and I say that a lot on this show. And I mean it every time I say it. This one is extremely unique. Yes. Um, it is written and directed by J.B. Gooman Jr., Starring Savannah Stalen as Spork, the titular character. Kevin Chung, Sidney Park, who kills it in this movie. Uh, <laughs> then there's Keith David, Elaine Hendricks, and you even have Yardley, Yardley Smith. We do, yes. I love Yardley. I also want to shout out another underappreciated department in this movie. Uh, the production design and the art direction <laughs> of this movie was incredible. It was incredible. The whole movie was It's a really complete piece, yeah. and it knows what it is. And it's quirky and it's weird and it's there are like uh, crayon drawings on the screen. It's it is such a strange. I don't know how to classify it because it <laughs> is unique. Totally. It is one of my favorite projects that I've worked on from start to finish. It It's one of those. I'll never be able to duplicate this experience or its sig significance. Mm -hmm. And every piece has such an amazing story from how I was attached to it to almost every single actor that we cast has such a specific, unique story that I'll never be able to recreate it. And I was on set for this film every single day as well. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, they just asked me to, to awesome. be on set and paid me to be there. And it was, it was amazing. And I well, got how did to know you become actors. part of the project? We'll start there. So Chad Allen, actor slash producer, uh, I knew him professionally and socially, and he came in to read for a project, a whole other different project. And after the audition, said, can, can I talk to you about this other project? 
So he gives me this script and he says, we really would like you to cast a film, read the script, tell us what you think. Uh, read the script. And I don't know if, where I was in my head, but it just didn't mesh with me at first. Uh, so I said, I, I don't know if this script is for me. I don't know if I'm the best person for this job. Mm -hmm. Cut to, I think it was about a year later, he comes back and says, well, now we have the money and we really want you to cast this film. So come meet the director, come meet the producers, and let's go from there. And from the moment I sat down with them, it was... It was very apparent that it was supposed to be me, and it was such a family right from the beginning. Uh, how, do, how do you say no to that? They really want you, and it feels comfortable. And I read the script again and liked it much more. I don't know where I was in my life at the time, but I loved it and jumped right into it. Well, with this one, with with any movie like this that is very unique, um, I would and maybe to categorize this. You could say it's kind of in the vein of maybe like a Napoleon Dynamite or... A little John Waters A little skit. bit, yeah. And I'm curious how much the casting dictates what the film like this becomes. Meaning yes. like how much do the actors' interpretations of the characters dictate where what ends up on the screen? Big time. I mean, JB is very specific. He knows what he wants, uh, which is fantastic. Though the actors really brought their thing into these crazy, quirky, eclectic characters. I mean, even the character names like Betsy Biatch and Tootsie Roll yeah. and Lucy Goosey. We knew that there would be one actor. We were not going to have a slew of actors that we were considering for each role. It'd be one. Mm. Then someone would walk in the room and own the role, which is literally what happened with every single role. Uh, and my favorite story of the care of the actors Please. is Sydney Park, who I believe was 12 at the time we cast her, but I met her and her family when she was eight mm -hmm. doing stand-up comedy at the... She was doing stand-up comedy at eight? She was doing, yes. A, the comedy store, one of those. This was a kid's Jesus. comedy night, and she was a spitfire. I mean, Sid the Kid, she was also on America's Got Talent or mm -hmm. one of those. Uh, she came out to do a set on the flavor of love as this young girl, and I didn't know what to think. I'm like, it was partly inappropriate and hilariously <laughs> funny, and everybody was laughing, and she owned that room, and she got a standing O, and after the show, I walked up to her and her mom to introduce myself, and right from that minute, it was, there was this instant spark and connection with them, and I said, look, I don't have anything right now. I don't, let's just stay in touch, and, and then let's see. So for four years, we stayed in touch, and uh, she's half African-American and half Asian, if I get that right. Uh, and she's very particular. As a little kid, she was very particular. So uh, we had to wait for the right role. Mm -hmm. And when this movie came along and I read it for that second time, I'm like, there's nobody else for Tootsie Roll. This is totally her. When I talked to the director and showed pictures, in his mind, he had something different. More of this, more of this, more of this. I'm like, don't worry. I understand what you're saying, but just trust me. You have to meet her. She's exactly what you're looking for. No, 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 no. She's not. She's not. She's not. Yes, she is. Can I just bring her in? Just it's two minutes of your time. OK, sure. So she walks in with her mom and she dressed herself for this role. I mean, she's totally not this character at all in real life. She transformed herself. I almost did not recognize her with what she did. And she walked in and she auditioned and there that was it. It was done. She was the girl. I don't remember how many people we saw for the role, but not many because she was the first day, one of the first up. And that was it. And she set the tone for the whole film with stories like that and how perfect each particular actor was. I mean, she was incredible. She was incredible. There, like when when she's in a scene in that movie, like there, if you want a kid with the most like energy and just fucking confidence, yeah, she has just had that thing. Was incredible. Yeah. yeah, and that's it's so rare to see that, and then to see what she's done after sport like right. she's killing it she's, she's killing doing it. really well and i and knew that that was there was no doubt that that was going to happen like i knew at eight she'd be where she was today mm -hmm. 
And and it was just the performance that she had at eight was that good that you it just was, knew. It was amazing. I mean, yeah. she's just that kid. And her mom also ended up being in the film playing her mom, which that's most people don't mom. realize that's her real oh, mom. Oh, that's great. So we were all on set together and we shot this film and in, in her mom was great. There, there was some good moments with oh, her yeah. mom too. Like oh, she yeah. was good. She was great. Yeah. But we all got to be together sweating it out in the hottest summer ever in the middle of the desert almost. And it was a crazy shoot and it was just amazing to be on set with these actors uh, and just get to know them and really watch them work. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, it was quite outstanding. Yeah. Um, so Savannah Stalin, who you cast as a spork in this movie. Yeah. Um, you've also cast in other movies. Yes. Uh, the, <laughs> the Axe Murders of Messia. Um, Villisca. Villisca. Yes. Oh, I'm bad at pronouncing. The Axe Murders of, of Visca. <laughs> I'm going to say it wrong again. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real place. Okay. <clears throat> um, and then in another film that's currently on the festival circuit called Lolo. Lolo. She is simultaneously heartbreaking and just emotionally available for everything in this movie at yeah. what I assume is a pretty young age too. Yeah. She was 12 and spork. Yeah. So she's a, you know, a young, young twenties mm -hmm. now. How did you come to find her? <laughs> Cause it's somebody that you seem to be championing. Well, I love her. I think uh, all of these actors in this film, I love till the end of time. Uh, Savannah is very special and she's very castable, so I have brought her in for many things and cast her in many things. Uh, when originally she was pitched to me by her agents, I said no, because what I was looking for was a otter looking, you know, the character is a hermaphrodite. So we needed someone who could walk that line. We were going to hire a female. We sort of needed someone to walk that line. When her agents pitched her, I thought, mm, she's just not right. She's she's very pretty, and I just don't think this is going to work. The agents at Coast to Coast begged me, no, 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 please, just trust us. This is what we do. They have one of the best kids departments in town, so trust us. She's right. Okay, sure, why not? And she came in looking totally different than I expected, mm. and 100% this character, and much like Sydney Park, she nailed it from line one. It was her. There was no competition. So that's two instances of these actors coming in. Yes. Unlike themselves. Correct. So with that, are you, because so many times you hear from casting directors, come in looking like your headshot. Right. So this movie was very opposite because yes. there's, these characters are just so crazy and out there that there's no one who's going to be this in real life, mm -hmm. as actors especially. But yes, normally we want to know who's going to walk in the room. We need to know that this person in the headshot or the demo reel is who's walking in the room. But these characters required such a transformation that it was never going to be anything that we expected. We needed to see these actors tell us who these characters were. Mm -hmm. And these actors did that. So to break that down for actors, there are instances where coming into a casting room, very opposite yourself, dressing differently and, and trying to embody the character can really work for you. Yes, absolutely. And I think I think it's obvious when that needs to happen. You know, if you're coming in for the lawyer or the accountant, that's what we need to see. But if you're auditioning for a very different film with a character name like Tootsie Roll <laughs> or Lucy Goosey with descript these crazy descriptions and you know they were all given the scripts. It's obvious that you're going to need to come in and create this character. And it is why, to me, it is so important for actors to come in and show us them and their take on the role mm -hmm. and show us who the character is. And that's really for any audition. You know, we need certain things out of this role. But when an actor comes in and shows us this is the role. This is what my my interpretation is, and this is this is it. I have seen writer directors sit there and be like, "Wow, you're right. It's not what I thought. It's what you thought, and I'm totally taking this. This is now the character. This is what we need. You're a hundred percent right." 
So that's based off of the strong choices that actors are yes. making that are still within the bounds Correct. of the story that is being told, not just coming in and I'm going to make this crazy choice. Right, right. It needs to be in the bounds it of. It still has to it, be focused. It needs to make sense, uh, but it needs to be a clear, distinct choice because so many actors take that first thought that comes to their mind which is usually the first thought that comes to each actor's mind who's reading for the role. Yes. And then we just see the same thing 50 times. But when you delve into it and you really think about it and you do your work and then you put it aside and come back to it, that's when these other choices happen. And you really start thinking about and committing to who these characters are and making some choices, some really strong choices, different choices. That's when we say take a risk. And make but this it's kind that of a second choice. or third pass yeah. of working on the character yes. that you can really start to actually take it's time. Chances. You need to take time. It's yeah. not. I mean, some auditions you can do the next day or you know in a few hours, but these lead roles require time and thought and in and intention. And it's not just going to be the first thing you think of and you're done. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and that's important for actors to hear because so often and. It, it, there is a bit of a balancing act, I think, because nowadays there's a lot of times where you're going to get the sides for your audition like the day before. Right. You have to do what you can. That's right. But do what you can. Do what you can. Spend as much time as you can with it. If you can, spend some time with it. Like you said, put it to the side. Think about other things. And then come back to it again and see if the choices that you made were good or not. But... Spend that time. Spend that time. I, I like to say there are things you can control and things you can't control. As for actors, for all of us, but for actors right now, the things you can't control, let go. You cannot control them, so stop spending your time and energy and worry on these things you cannot control. And focus on the things you can control and control the things you can control 100% of the time. Because 95% of the time doesn't cut it when there's so many actors who are nailing it 100%. 100%. You have to control those things and you can control being prepared. And if we've given you the audition an hour before, a day before, we know what we did. We know what we're asking of you. Mm. But I see plenty of actors who have days and days and days to prepare You're coming and, and still. read the script who are at 70% or yeah. looking at their sides too much or they just haven't done the work. And I'm thinking, you can control this. So you're telling me- You're not gonna do the you work. You don't want the job. Because yeah. you're, you're not showing me that your choices and what, that you really want this. Well, and that's a, that subject matter is something we haven't talked about a lot on this show. The things that actors do wrong is is something I've kind of stayed a little bit away from yep. um, because I like to highlight the good. Yeah, sure. But I think it, it is important to know that casting directors do see it when you're not, when you don't put in the work, when you don't follow instructions, it's when you don't painfully clear from second one. And you guys have memories that are like steel traps, so. To go in once and to just like throw it away and not do anything, I feel like there's a lot of times where you do that and you're never coming back to that office. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I, there are very few actors that I will say I'm never bringing them back. Mm -hmm. uh, I can sort of tell when it's an or at off least day there's going to be a like. Yeah, for the I other don't know day if I want to bring that person in. Absolutely. Yeah, we had uh, an actor, I'm not even specifying male or female, who came in the other day. And after the session, independently, we all sort of were talking about each actor and we all had the same reaction. This actor didn't seem to want to be there. They didn't seem to care at all, like as if, as if this was the last thing they wanted to be, to be doing today. If this four people, five people had that same thought independently, that doesn't bode well for you mm -hmm. because you didn't, you know, there's the book, the room, not the job mentality. Well, they certainly didn't book the room. And I don't know how quick we would be to bring this person back because we all got nothing. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that you've talked about in uh, one of these other interviews that I've seen is your love for casting, specifically independent film. Yes. That's, that's the world that you've kind of embodied a lot of. You've worked in television and, and even big feature films uh, a lot, too. 
What is different about independent film and why is it preferable to you over other types of film and television? Uh, I like the independent world because it's more family oriented. Mm. You know, when you have a, a big network film and I'm not at all <laughs> dissing network and studios, there's a lot of people. Yeah, it's there an army. So, there has to be. an army and you have to please all of them. And there's everyone has their own opinion and their own personality. And there is a lot of red tape and a lot of walls for us to run up against. And there's just less of that in the indie world. It's the director and a few producers. Sometimes the investors are involved and you communicate with them. But it's it's just a more of a family creative world. And you can really get into it. And you can spend the time and, you know, texting or calling or emailing with the director and producers at all hours on the weekends. And it's just very... It's more relaxed, it's more creative, it's more supportive uh, because there's not that whole other side of it that they have to worry about that a studio or network would. Uh, and there's more opportunity to bring in undiscovered actors or newer actors or actors that are not usually famous. You know, when I did Spork, none yeah. of the kids who were all the leads, they were nobody. I mean, no one knew who they were. All of the adults, the famous adults, were all very secondary characters. Yeah you know, who worked a day here, a day there, but it were, it was just these kids and we didn't have to find the famous, I don't know, are, are there famous 12 year olds, but we didn't have to find <laughs> the famous 12 year olds. It was just finding the best actors and really being able to get to know the director and producers at this personal sort of family level. It's a much more enjoyable experience uh, and a much more creative experience there seems to be a lot less of a dilution of your creative input as well on smaller projects. Correct. Uh, the directors and producers are more apt to listen to us and uh, take our input and have their minds changed. Mm. Uh, they've hired us. And sometimes on these indie films, we have a lot more experience than the director or producers who may be Should making be their, their first, first film movie. or third film. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of that. Uh, and I, I feel more listened to and that what I've been hired to do is something that's really important to the process as opposed to a body bringing us actors. Mm -hmm. Well, I think going off of the back end of that, of the independent world, let's talk a little bit about non-independent things. Sure. Um, so you've done three projects now with uh, Rob Reiner. Yep. Um, where you're working alongside of uh, a very big casting director. <laughs> legend. Uh, a, a legend <laughs> in casting, Miss Jane Jenkins. Yes. Um, let's talk about Shock and Awe first, because okay. that, is, that is the one that I saw uh, most recently. Um, directed by Rob Reiner. It stars Woody Harrelson, James Marsden. Uh, Rob Reiner's in it as well. It's got Tommy Lee Jones, who I fucking love in this movie. Right. I love it every movie <laughs> and everything he's ever done, but he's really good in this one. Um, Jessica Biel, Mia Mila Jovovich, uh, and Richard Schiff. I also saw Jay Seals in there. Uh, shout out to Jay yep. Seals. Um, I know Jay, he was in a project that we did years ago. Um, really lovely guy. Um, it follows, like we said a little bit earlier, a group of Knight Ritter journalists as they follow and report on the events around 9-11 and all the political aspects that led to the war in Afghanistan and Iraq. And um, it's it's kind of told through their story acted out by these guys uh, and news footage and recordings around that time. So it kind of puts you really back in that yes, time. Absolutely. And there's something really relevant about what goes on in that movie as to what's going on in the world right now. Right. And, you know, Rob Reiner is a very political guy. <laughs> yes. And has been all of his career. That's right. And I mean, look at his early work, you know, as an actor on one of the, if not the most political TV show of all time. And in a way that didn't shit on discourse. Right. That actually right. played up the discourse and let you know that it's okay to have those arguments and those conversations 
because it's important to have those arguments right. and conversations. And I think that's what he did really well with this one. I agree. It's, I'm so, so personally and professionally disappointed that most people don't even know what movie we're speaking about right now and they yeah. haven't seen it, but it's available on Amazon. It is. Uh, and you should absolutely go watch it. Um, it, it is political in nature. Yes. Um, and it does have a Rob Reiner spin on it. So it is it is probably a little left of center mm -hmm. in, in its presentation. But that being said, it seems like and, and I didn't do a, a super deep dive, but I did a little bit of research into it, that the points that they put out are documented points like this is this Absolutely. is across the board. That movie is. It is a true story. Yes. I mean, obviously not everything is 100 percent, but it is a true story of these journalists who were the only journalists at the time who had the facts right mm -hmm. about weapons of mass destruction and who was telling the truth. And nobody would listen to them. And unfortunately, uh, the right stories didn't get published and cut to. I don't know, years later when Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and everyone else had to apologize for giving misinformation, these guys were the ones who had the real information that nobody would listen to because the, they were the, the only lies ones. from the White House on down. Um, it, it, so this is your third time working with Rob Reiner and Jane. Uh, and the first time that you'd worked as a proper casting director in this situation. Yes. Uh, uh, I the did previous two times. films as Jane's associate working with Rob and then this film I, to maybe one of the proudest accomplishments of my career to be a casting director with Jane Jenkins, <laughs> who's cast probably 10 of everybody's favorite films, yeah. if not more. Uh, and again, to, to continue the relationship with Rob it was very special, uh, and to build on the disappointment that nobody knows what this film is or has seen it, it was just, I know it sounds so, I don't know, silly, but to see my name mm. casting by Jane Jenkins and Jeremy Gordon, for me as, you know, I'll always be just this little kid from Brooklyn, to see that on a Rod Ryder film just still blows my mind. I loved every minute of that experience and Jane is, to this day, a very good friend of mine and one of the greatest people ever, as is Rob. It was just an amazing experience. Well, what happened between the previous two to this one that allowed you to come on as a I proper casting director? Time, like Jane is, talk about no bullshit. There's no bullshit with Jane or really with Rob. It, it just, it is what it is. And having done two films with them, I guess it was just the next natural step. Jane is also mostly retired, yeah. except when Rob calls. Uh, <laughs> Which her last three movies have been. Right. <laughs> Mo, you know, many of her, her last films have. And, it, you know, there's just that next progression. And if we're going to do more with this team, I think that it's just the natural next step to be a casting director with her. Uh, and I will be forever grateful. And I'm sure... As soon as there's another president and Rob can step back from politics for a hot second, <laughs> there'll be another film that I'll do with them. Uh, it, it's just literally the most amazing, fun What was process. that like? I mean, to, to, what, what, was the, what was actually the process of being attached to that movie again? And then what was the conversation like of... No, we don't want you to be associate this time. This time you're going to be casting Jay, It was Jane and I on the phone, you know, all of a 30 second conversation. And it was just, it is what it is. Are we going to do this one together? Let's cast it together. It's quick. There's no BS. There's no time wasted on anything when we're working with Jane and Rob. And they have their shorthand. They've worked together for so long. And it is just a great experience. I mean, Rob is the easiest person to work for. He knows what he wants. He doesn't want too many choices, gets overwhelmed by having too many great actors to choose from. So it's a great process. And who doesn't want to be in a Rob Reiner film? So I will it's say easy it's easier to find those right, folks. It's yeah. easier to find these folks, but still, you know, we do what we do. And it's just it's just a fantastic experience to watch Rob with actors in the room. Just super laid back and chill and is so appreciative of actors and their work and them as human beings and 
of course, they all know and love him. And it's just it's just a love fest. I mean, it's not there's no stress and angst. I mean, there's there's stress of making films, but it's just happy times, good times. And he's an amazing person, a human being. And to be sitting next to him and working with him and oh, it's still mind blowing that uh, <laughs> I, I'm in a room sitting next to Meathead and I'm reading with actors in front of Rob Ryder. And it, it freaked me out at first. And then he told me, Jeremy, you're a good actor. I was like, all right, good. I don't have to be scared anymore. <laughs> it's just it's just awesome. Yeah. Well, I mean, working with Rob Reiner, that that should be on every actor's list for sure. Yes. Um, reading for Jane Jenkins, that should be on every <laughs> actor's list. I mean, the fact that you've worked with her is is pretty fantastic in and of itself. Anybody who knows anybody in casting has heard of Jane, along with her longtime partner, Janet Hirsch. And so, yes. Um, who I'm still trying to get on the show. I'm, uh, she's retired, retired. She, but she's I'm, very happily yes, retired. I've I'm talked sure to her, I've talked to her multiple times. Okay. <laughs> and she, because I, I, so I used to shoot fashion <clears throat> photography and her husband used to hang out at the fashion photography studio uh, occasionally. So I knew Michael and through Michael had met Janet a couple different times and, and talked to her when we were first starting this, the idea of this show. And she was just like, no, I'm, I am yeah. retired. She's, yeah, she's happily done. I don't want to talk <laughs> anything about movies. Um, but he, she, she and Janet cast everything from the Princess Bride to Apollo 13, Beautiful Mind and the Harry Potter kids, Space Jam and, and so many movies. So many films, movies. it's insane. Uh, how the hell did you become close <laughs> with Jane Jenkins and how did you become, you know, somebody who now works with her? Uh, through another casting director, Lisa Beach, who okay. I have worked for on and off for many, many, many years and many projects. And another incredible another, casting right? director. So her and Sarah Kathman are partners mm -hmm. and I've worked for them for a long time. Uh, it was, and I'll never forget the call, but it was January, like sort of before Pala season was starting. Uh, I get a phone call. I think I was home washing dishes and I don't usually answer calls if I don't know who's calling. When I saw the, the number ring and I, it was a two and three number and I thought, okay, it's pilot season. It's two and three. This maybe is an important call. I should get it. And I pick up and she says, hi, Jeremy, this is Jane Jenkins. And I'm thinking to myself, no, it's not. There's no, it's not. <laughs> it's what be what stupid friend Jane of mine is this? Chick. Like this, I'm being punked. She said, Lisa Beach gave me your phone number. I'm about to start a film with Rob Reiner and I need an associate. Are you available? Can we meet? I was dumbfounded, jaw drop, like, um, yeah, <laughs> yes, yes, whatever, yes. And we were sitting at Starbucks the next day as if we had been besties forever. She's super easy to speak with and get along with. And uh, that was a film... Rob directed called Being Charlie. Yes. And that was the first film that the three of us did together. Uh, and it, right from there, she said, yeah, we'll, we'll do more films together. Then along came LBJ and then Shock and Awe. And now she told me, she goes, when I work, you work. She goes, I can't, oh, I'm, I'm retired and can't do this without you. So if I get, if we do another film, you're, you're with me, right? I'm like, do you need to ask? <laughs> like, yes, whatever you want, always. So with these kinds of movies, uh, and we'll, and we'll stick with shock and all, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about LBJ as well. Um, who was attached on this one beforehand? Like, because I have to assume it's Rob Reiner. He knows everyone. He's sure. been in the industry forever. Everybody wants to be in his movies. Yep. You could probably throw a dart at a board <laughs> of actors, hit it. And just have him call them and ask yeah. how, who was attached? How, did, Woody, how did that process work? Woody Harrelson was the only one he was. attached. Okay. Uh, they did LBJ together as well. Yes. Uh, and he was attached to LBJ Incredible as well. Incredible LBJ. I mean, LBJ was amazing. Really good. Uh, so it was just Woody that was attached and we cast everybody else. Okay. So when you're casting, you know, James Marsden at this point, who's just an incredible actor incredible. and blown up over these past few years. He's been, he's been big for a while, but like really, really coming to his own, I think over these past few years, are, are you sending the, are those, uh, offers that you're sending, you yeah, guys are sending their offers, their meetings, uh, most 
of the actors, I mean, not most, a good, a fair number of actors came in to meet with Rob and all of us. We sat around conference table and just chatted about the film and the role and the vision and where everybody was and answer questions. Uh, but no audition. It was, you know, a so sort on of that offer scale, pending this meeting. A lot of those, are, a lot of those, may, especially the major roles, yes. are those types of, and, and is that, a standard is that a way that things are done on on that kind of scale? Yeah, fairly I often? think uh, no matter the the project, uh, you know, the actors of note who are you know these name actors, whom audience members will know, are either straight offers or offers pending a meeting. Sometimes it's an offer pending a one time read test type of thing, but especially in the indie world, again, when there's less of that to have to yeah. go through. It's just a meeting. We're just going to sit around and chat. And what conversations are being had in those meetings, though? Where you're discussing, I'm sure the film and the that film, sort of thing. The role, uh, what Rob sees for the role, what the actor got from reading the script, and where they see the role going. Questions that the actors have, uh, requests that the actors have. Sometimes they'd like love to do this for the role or, or mm. see the role go here. Uh, sometimes the actors are concerned the role's too small. Uh, or that it's not enough about them. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it is really the time for everyone to put their cards on the table and, and chat it out and to see if this is going to work. And do we get along? Are we going to like each other? Do we have the same vision? And can we mesh our visions together? Now, as a casting director in that room, what is your role in that situation? To sit there and be quiet. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's really for Rob and or the director and the actors. Sometimes... We're not even in that room, and it, the, the less people, the better, so that they can really get into it and not sure. have to worry about being watched. Uh, but uh, sort of on these films, a little input here and there, or someone may ask us a question or refer to something in casting, but for the most part, it's just to be there and support whatever the actor and the director need. Mm -hmm. The next one we should chat about, well, let's, let's stick on the uh, Rob Reiner uh, yeah. train for a moment and talk a little bit about LBJ. It is this really wonderful cast that's kind of built around Woody Harrelson as yeah. LBJ, um, who's completely hidden in this character, except you, like, you can see his teeth and you're like, oh, those are Woody's teeth. And then... Hair makeup for Jim did an amazing so, job. so, so good. He, he is he is LBJ. He yes. looks exactly like him. It's incredible. Um, and it follows him as he kind of aligns himself with John F. Kennedy, rises to the presidency, and then deals with the civil rights struggle of the 1960s. There were great performances across the board. Um, Jennifer Jason Lee is wonderful as Lady Bird. Uh, see Thomas Howe is there, Bill Pullman. Uh, Jeffrey Donovan plays John F. Kennedy. Casting to match real live people is always fascinating to me. And a challenge yes. I can only imagine. Um, especially such famous people. Correct. I mean, John F. Kennedy is, in, you know, <laughs> and, and, and there is extremely. So is there anything that you learned about casting real life people in this movie that you can speak of? Sure. Um, you know, it is a challenge and a little scary slash anxiety building, but also exciting because you're, you know, when you nail it and you know, when it's not going to be right. Uh, it's, easier in a way that there's not 8,000 submissions because there's not all that many people who really look like the real life person mm -hmm. and the right height and build and weight and, and all of that. Uh, and in this movie in particular, we needed accents. The Kennedy's yeah. with Boston and, and, and the accents were very important. So, And your Bobby Kennedy, I didn't write his name down. What was his name? Um, Michael Stahl David. He was incredible. Not just, not just hold his own, but he's given it. He's given it, and he flew out from New York to audition. And when Rob sees it, he sees it, and he knows, and he doesn't need, sorry that you've been asked to prepare 12 scenes, but I only need to see a paragraph. He knows when he knows, and he didn't get to do all of the scenes. And I, I walked him out, and he was so bummed because he thought they're just, I blew it. I'm like, you didn't blow it. I'm like, I think not to speak out of turn, but I think you nailed it. If he didn't need to see more, it's because you nailed it. And I know that I'm sure he was bummed on the ride oh, home, sure. whatever, yeah. but he got the role and that was it. When Rob, when Rob sees it, it's, he doesn't 
there's that no bullshit. We don't need to bullshit our way through the rest of this because you're it. You're the guy. That's mm-hmm. it. We're done. I, I love the efficiency of that. <laughs> yes. I really, really do. Uh, so there is another movie of yours that I watched. Yeah. Uh, I watched this one last night. Um, I want to watch it again. It was great. Uh, Rust Creek. It is out. Uh, it's on Amazon Prime right now. You can rent it. Um, it's killing the festival circuit right is, now. It is incredibly good as a thriller. Um, directed by Jim McGowan, starring Hermione Corf- Corfield, yep. uh, Denise Devel- Del Vera, Jeremy Glazer, Micah Hopkin, Hopman, yep. uh, Daniel R. Hill, Jay Paulson, and a few other people. Um, first of all, it looks like home. I'm from Northwest Arkansas. The Appalachians run all the way down through into those Ozark Plateau. It looks and feels like where it's I come where from. So shot. I was like, it was shot there. I mean, it was a very important it, character. It was yes, the, the yeah, area yeah. is a character. Yes, I think people need to give Jim McGowan more money to make more things. <laughs> I agree. Uh, everyone needs to go out and watch this movie at festival and rent it and and everything you can because she needs to make more movies. It's her second film. I'm, yes. I'm blanking on the name of the first film, uh, but I had worked with her before on. Uh, a stage reading and mm. so she is the one who called me for this project okay and she is very special and she will blow up no doubt she will be you know an, an it director momentarily yeah and i hope to keep working with her she's yeah. phenomenal it's and she and loves 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 people and actors and is a wonderful person it's a really well directed film and you can tell i think you can tell that by the fact that all of the different pieces that come together all work together, much like Spork. Yeah. Spork was well directed in that the director had this overarching vision that really kind of focused everybody in on what needed to happen. Yes. And I think that that happened with Russ Creek as there's well. There's a lot going on in Russ Creek. There's there is. so much and it's outside and it's a thriller and there's so many pieces of this puzzle that really needed to be put together. And I think Jen is very special and I heard Nothing but amazing reports from the actors who were outside in Kentucky in November. It was freezing <laughs> and everyone had a great time. Well, and, and the cast in this is relatively unknown. Like there's some faces in the movie. Some faces be like, know, but right. I've seen that guy. Right. I don't know his name, but I've seen that right. guy. Um, which is a joy for casting. Yeah. Well, and. Which of them, I'm curious, did you know beforehand? Were, I mean, you, were you familiar with or like I, knew? We knew a lot of them. You did. Because that's what our job is, of even course. if they're unknown to the public at large. But Jeremy Glazer, who was in Spork and I've known mm-hmm. since those days. Um, I knew who Jay Paulson was and I knew Micah. Uh, um, Sean O'Brien. Mm-hmm. Uh, there were a few other actors that I knew not not best friends, but I knew or knew of or has read for me before. Uh, Hermione was a new. I had no idea who she was, but she, she was, was great. Pitched for us, and I had. She went up against other actors who were She's much British more too, well known. Yeah. She's British. Yeah. Uh, she Brits will come and also be jobs. a huge name. Well, they deserve it because <laughs> they're yes. super prepared and yeah. educated, and they do not mess around. There's no, no. bullshit with them. They do it. Acting is taken taken very seriously yes. in the UK. And she beat out well-known actors over here, and she was amazing. And everyone will know who she is in the next year or two. She's phenomenal. I agree. Absolutely. Um, What was the collaboration on the casting of this project like? Well, I I, I guess, actually, when you're working an independent film, the collaboration we talked about a little bit earlier is is greater. What was the collaboration like on this one? So I brought in uh, Caroline Leem, who's another casting director. Uh, I was casting a few things simultaneously, so I uh, brought in Caroline and Mm -hmm. we cast this film together. Again, I had worked with Jen before on a staged reading, so I knew her, not incredibly well, but knew her. Uh, She's very into what we think. Mm. What casting things she has her ideas and she may have some people she wants to read or prototypes, but she wanted us to to guide her and and to show her who these actors were. And we read a lot of people. She was very open and into it and really cared about what we thought. And she would give us her opinion, but then ask what we thought. There was no shutdown at, at any point. She was great to work with and is great with the actors. She can give direction that 
actors can take in the room and make that change in a, a moment. So she's re- she was really wonderful to work with. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the things, too, that I took note of this movie uh, on the IMDb, it states in accordance with Lunacy Productions, the production company that made this film, mandate to support female filmmakers. Most yes. of the key roles in this movie were filled by women, including the director of photography, production designer, colorist and sound mixer, which uh, of those positions that were, were specifically mentioned, that's like usually maybe 2% of that's productions all and, uh, I do that. I believe Jen even made a public statement on Twitter or, or somewhere that it is her goal on her films to, I don't know the percentage, but 50% or more or whatever the number is to have women mm-hmm. uh, in crew positions and important positions. And, and, and I, that's I applaud her for that. She's very involved with women in film and, and other such uh, organizations out here supporting women in film. And I applaud her for that. Mm-hmm. And I think she's been doing it for longer than it's been a, a conversation that we're all having. She's been doing it. Absolutely. I mean, there there is a major push in the industry right now and in the world right now for inclusive, inclusivity in storytelling. Yes. And I think it's very important to, to be able to see stories uh, about people who are like you to help you get through things. I mean, that's that's why I got into this industry in the first place. White fella, there's a lot of stories about white fellas. I've had a lot of connections to a lot of different characters over the years. And, you know, I never really thought about that until this conversation really started Absolutely. to come up. I think that's one of the reasons why Rust Creek is important and doing so well is mm. this very, very strong female lead character who gets into a situation and knows how to get out of it and keeps her wits about her and doesn't go through that stereotypical distressed female thing. I don't know what to do. I mean, right. She owned her moments and her situation. And I, I, that's what I, one of the things I loved about the film. Mm-hmm. And then, She's not the damsel in distress. No, not at all. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I thought I thought it was really well done, and like I said, people give Jen McGowan more money yes, to please. make more things. <laughs> uh, I know we're getting close to our wrap out here. I do want to talk about a couple other projects. Yeah, go for it. Um, we're the Millers was one that you worked on. Uh, it was a comedy in 2013, directed by Ross and Marshall Thurber, starring Jason Sudeikis, Jennifer Aniston, Emma Roberts, Will Poulter, Ed Helms, Nick Offerman, and Catherine Hahn. Catherine Hahn is one of my favorite She's people amazing. in the world. Um, I really think that this was the funniest movie of 2013. There was, I feel like at that time, 2012, 2013, even into 2014, there was a lot of swings and misses when it came came to comedy. Uh, and this one is still like, I rewatched it for this interview because it is really one of my f- favorite movies. It was of that time. hilarious. And that's another film I was the associate on for Lisa Beach and Sarah yes. Kasman. Well, and that was our Will Poulter find. I mean, this, I, I don't he know. He came out of nowhere. I don't remember him. He came out of nowhere and yeah. we gave and him his first. he was so funny. Yes. And now he's just. He's huge now. Ruling it. And he was, the, for me, my favorite thing about that film. He's so funny. And I mean, it's just like such a, such a kind and like clueless character <laughs> who's so yeah. sweet and. And then to like have him make out back and forth with Emma Roberts and with Jennifer Aniston and then ju- like just everything about that. So, I really I love, love that movie. film. It, was, it got us an RDS nomination. Yeah. So I, thankfully people saw that film and they know what we're talking about. Yes, yes. absolutely. <laughs> um, it, you, like you said, you worked under Lisa Beach and Sarah Katzman on this one, uh, casting directors. You've worked with multiple times as well. You worked with them on the TV show series V, Friends with Benefits, yes. Hawaii Five O, and The Wolverine. I like that movie, too. Uh, Are there any good stories from the casting on this one? Because I have to imagine with the situations that are in this movie that the casting process has to be a really fun process. This and and, and, uh, Horrible Bosses that Mm -hmm. I also did with uh, Lisa Beach and Sarah Casper. The the scripts are just so funny and, and, and out there that you are having a blast in the room. And any, especially any actor who knows... Lisa Beach, she's a huge personality and she's loud and she's funny and she makes the actors super comfortable. And I keep telling her she should be an actor because she's awesome. <laughs> she, whether it's drama or comedy, she's so in it and she's so in it with these actors. And it just 
just fun in the room to see these actors auditioning and reading the lines. It, when you have a movie, a crazy comedies like this, it's just super fun to be in the room and watch and laugh and discover. And it's, yeah. it's just fun. No one's crying. This isn't some intense drama. We're all in that mode. It, it was just fun. Mm -hmm. How did you come to start working with Lisa and, and Sarah? I was working with, I believe it was Gail Levin when she was at Paramount. And this was before the V pilot. Mm -hmm. And Lisa needed an associate. And I'm pretty sure, if I remember correctly, that Gail sent me to Lisa to do the V pilot. Uh, I had, was just working with Gail in the Paramount office on helping with self-tapes for the lead of The Last Airbender. That was like a month-long gig. And then I went to do the V pilot with Lisa Beach and Sarah Katzman. And then Gail stole me back to do We Bought a Zoo for Gavin Crow. Mm -hmm. So I went back and forth and then went back to Lisa and Sarah for various other projects you seem like a hustler like you <laughs> you've, you've busted your ass you've, yes. you've made things happen i'm curious if you have any advice for people who want to be a casting director as far as how because you've found yourself working with some of the biggest casting directors in the world and some of the biggest directors in the world Advice. It's hard. Yes, sure. I can give advice. It's hard because I definitely had a different start. I wasn't the intern. I wasn't the assistant. I, I sort of fell into a lot of things and I guess have had the right connections with people to give me opportunities. But I'm also the yes guy. Uh, and not just in casting, but in life. Meaning. Meaning. So... Great example. Uh, I just finished season two of Cloak and Dagger with Corbin Bronson, mm -hmm. uh, who, after he hired me, told me he had interviewed a few people, but they did not were not willing to be an associate, that they only wanted to be a casting director. Uh, and I don't know who they are, so I don't know their resumes, but I could also, if I wanted to, take that train of thought and yeah, I'm just going to be a casting director, but you'll lose out on other opportunities. So saying yes to that with Corbin. So I was his associate on Cloak and Dagger, but then we cast a Snapchat series together during the same time as both of us casting directors. And I will hopefully be working with him again, uh, co-casting something together in the near future. You say yes, you do a lot of things. And I've done a lot of student films and short films and low budget films for newer directors to build relationships that lead places. I did a short film for J.S. Mayank uh, called Emit, which is time backwards. Mm -hmm. uh, you did Emit. I did no Emit. Shit. Yes. I loved Emit. We, so we did a series ages. Do you remember Emit? It was on our, uh, it was on Short on Shorts. It was the backwards, the time spelled backwards sort one. sci-fi-ish. Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's been, it's been a while, it's but been a I didn't while. know you yeah. did that. That's I dope. I did that. Yeah. And that led to America 2.0, which is also JS. So it's ah. building these relationships and just getting involved in, and hustling and doing everything and working 100 hours a week and always having the next 12 projects ready to go so that there's something to do and doing everything. Yeah. Well, uh, I know Maria's looking at me like we need to wrap up. <laughs> I do want to talk <laughs> quickly, yes. very quickly, um, because you just mentioned it, America 2.0. Yes. So America 2.0 is a podcast. Um, and, and like we said earlier, I think I've seen that you've said West Wing is the best television show ever. Yes. And this podcast released last year is a serialized podcast that has been compared to the West Wing. Um, we've never really talked about casting podcasts, and I'm sure there's a lot of people uh, that are listening right now that are going, wait, casting podcasts? Well, it's just two people talking about uh, <laughs> casting directors. What do you need to cast for? This is a fully scripted story performed by sometimes with some of these podcasts are massive casts. Yes. Um, it's like a cross between an audio book and a TV show, basically. How did you come to cast this project, which I am assuming now that you did Emit and he brought you on yes. with that? So I've known JS since Emit. Mm -hmm. um, he sent me what was originally 
a pilot script for America 2.0 and just asked me to read it. And I fell in love with it immediately. And I said, let's table read this so you can hear it. I think this is very important. I think you should hear what you wrote. So uh, we threw together a table read and uh, called in friends like Shanola Hampton and Elaine Hendricks and Nicholas Gonzalez and Jack Coleman, who was in Emit, uh, and Spencer Garrett. So friends, who, established actors who really could bring something to this. And at the table read, it was just like light bulbs going off. It was just so phenomenal. Uh, and JS quickly came back and said, I don't want to, I told him the process of making a pilot and getting anyone to listen to it in five years down the road, no one's doing anything with it. He took the pilot script and turned it into a six episode podcast that he and his writing partner self-financed hmm. that we just went with. So it was six episodes casting. Uh, it wasn't sessions. We didn't have casting sessions. It was calling in actors that we knew. Uh, it's a huge all-star cast, which uh, was is part of its success, and mm -hmm. then actors that we know with great voices who really could bring to the role what was needed, especially because nobody recorded together. Everyone was in the recording oh. studio alone, yeah, which really adds this whole other dimension of the editing and the process for bringing a podcast together. But you know, Lawrence Fishburne and Patrick Adams and. Kate Walsh and Steven Weber and Shinola Hampton and Iqbal Theba and I, a killer lots cast. of people, but the cast is huge because the material is incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, Spencer Garrett, who's my producing partner, who also knows every human being in the world and is the most well-connected person. He was a huge help in casting and reaching out to people like Lawrence Fishburne. Uh, but it, the material is what sold it. And then each actor sitting down or, or speaking on the phone with JS and everybody loved it. We have a waiting list of famous actors who wanted to be involved, who couldn't, huh. who are begging us to be involved with whatever the future holds for 2.0. Uh, people want more of it. That's rad. Yeah, it's That's awesome. really cool to get people excited to be a part of a podcast in it's that It's amazing. Sense. I mean, we were a top 10 podcast in yeah. six countries, number one in some countries. We got the Apple masthead banner at some point. So it became hugely successful. And I know that there is a future in other iterations for 2.0, as mm -hmm. well as hopefully a second season. Very cool. Yeah. Well, everybody should totally listen to that. Yeah, it's on uh, Apple and every yes. podcast platform. All the different platforms, imagine. the Stitchers yes. and the... Yeah. Stitchers and then Spotify. And uh, the last thing I want to talk about um, briefly is that you started a Facebook group. And I say that <laughs> yeah. and it sounds a little silly, but this is a proper Facebook group that you started. You started in 2007 called Casting Directors for Actors. And you are about 3,000 people shy of being a 100,000 member Insane. group. <laughs> and it is a very, very, very active group. Yes. There's a lot of back and forth between casting directors and actors. Um, and I'm curious why, why you started it. How, how, because in 2007, there weren't a lot of, like that was starting to be a thing. Yes. It was, well, first of all, Facebook itself was very different back then yeah. and groups were very different. I started it because I kept getting questions, messages from random actors, which to me seemed like the most basic information, basic questions that then I was surprised that actors didn't know, but I was more frustrated that there was no actual resource to get these questions answered. Some of these actors were all over the the globe and of course they may not know but like why an actor in LA who's a member of SAG doesn't have the uh, a resource to get this question answered it was very frustrating to me uh, and I don't like this like curtain between actors and casting directors we're all on the same side and I wanted to create something to at least for me to be able to show I'm here with you we're in the same boat I'm your friend let's go and so I started this group called Casting Directors for Actors, F-O-R-4, -R, not the number four, because someone else has that group that they tried to steal my idea. <laughs> um, and it, at first, for a long time, for years, it was just me, just me alone answering questions, spending a lot of time 
organizing the group and, and having spreadsheets and whatever and, and being a, being there for actors. Uh, and then it just started growing and growing and growing. And I don't know at what point, but for many, many, many years now, Edward Hong, who is an actor, some people may know him as the Cinnabon monster. Uh, he was in the group and he and I became friends and he has been helping me run this group for a long time, years, I don't know how long, but many years, and who now is sort of the lead on it, as mm -hmm. it's overwhelming, it needs so much attention, as there are 100,000 people around the world, part of this group, and it just, you can go on and see, it just moves, the, the page just moves, and there's, yeah. it's constant, and he has been pivotal at keeping this alive, and answering questions, and it's been great, I've met actors, the, my favorite story, and then we'll, I, I can move on from it, but my favorite story is an actor from Luxembourg tweeted me, telling me, you know, I'm here, I'm an actor in Luxembourg, there's not much here in terms of the entertainment industry, but my friend in Germany told me about your Facebook group and said I may be able to get some of my questions answered there, could you help me? That's just so awesome. Like, that's just so cool. Or this mother of a kid actor in Nairobi who wanted to get in the business and had questions. I'm like, ah, how did this reach there? It's just, that's just so cool. That's what social media is, but it's so cool. Uh, and I love the group for what it is. And I, unfortunately, I just don't have the time to be involved with the day to day of it anymore, but it's there. And I hear from people all the time that they know the group, they're members of the group, mm -hmm. they've heard of the group, they've gotten jobs from the group or met people. So I'm so glad that it exists along with 100,000 other people. It's crazy. Well, because it is such a uh, strong resource and a resource that has been built up over the past 12 years, are there any things that you've learned over these past 12 years that casting directors should take note of from actors? Yeah, Um there's this, uh, sometimes I think we forget because we're working on high profile projects. There's such a high percentage of actors who aren't anywhere yet in their career or don't know much yet. We're just also used to working in LA with this group of actors who knows everything because of their, their experience or because they're famous. And that's the world that so many of us deal with. But there's then the rest of it that maybe our, the locations casting directors are more familiar with these this group of actors that don't know much and they don't know what to do they don't know what's right they don't know what's wrong or what's proper or common and it's nice to be reminded that we need to check ourselves and, and when actors come to us in asking for this or in a way that isn't what we do we have to remember that there's la and hollywood and then there's the rest of the world and there are actors everywhere. So it sort of brings me back down to that human level of everyone needs something different and, and not everybody knows the same thing, which is why I started the group in the first place. I think that's great. Yeah. I think that's a really important thing across the board with with this industry in, gen in general. I think we sometimes get lost in our bubbles yeah. of realizing that People's ignorance isn't necessarily something to, you know, poo-poo on. No, it's, not at all. Yeah. Uh, where can people find you on the internet? They can find me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Jeremy Casts, mm -hmm. plural C-A-S-T-S. -S. Uh, that's probably the best way. I have an Instagram profile. I Follow me because I can seem to figure out Instagram. I post pictures <laughs> of my nephew all the time and nobody seems to care. Uh, my Facebook group, Casting Directors for Actors, F-O-R-4. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I try to keep my personal Facebook. I don't do like random friend requests with people I don't know. Uh, but that group can get to me, though I'm not as active on there as Ed Hong is, who's running the group. So Twitter is, Twitter's the great way. All right. Yeah. Fantastic. Everybody reach out and say hi. Say hi. I don't watch bite. Shock and Awe. Go watch Spork. <laughs> and, Please uh, watch Shock and Awe. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great day. Thanks so much. 
We hope that you have enjoyed this episode of Placing Faces. Jeremy is another one that I think you're going to be seeing for a really long time doing really good work. Do not forget to like, comment, subscribe, love, heart, thumbs up, and share this episode so we can keep making the show. Let's be honest. We're going to keep making the show whether or not you do any of those things, but wouldn't it feel nice if you did those things? A thousand thanks to the producer to end all producers, Miss Maria Perry, making things possible since forever. I'm also going to hawk some wares and tell you about the Western that I happen to be in called The Kid that's coming out on DVD and Blu-ray and those streaming services I keep hearing about on June 6th. It is a different retelling of the Billy the Kid story, starring Dane DeHaan as Billy the Kid, Ethan Hawke as Sheriff Pat Garrett, Chris Pratt plays the bad guy, I play one of Billy's gang members named Billy Wilson, whose real-life counterpart was captured with Billy the Kid and grew up about an hour away from where I grew up. It is directed by the incredible Vincent D'Onofrio, cast by Mary Vernu, Reva Khan Thompson, and Angelique Midthunder. It was such a pleasure to be a part of, and I hope that you guys get a chance to watch it and enjoy. Placing Faces is powered by Collaborator.com, a media production service connecting media professionals to companies, brands, and agencies, allowing you to scale your production based on your needs. Video professionals find work, and companies save money. We would also like to thank our partners at the Casting Society of America for helping introduce us to so many of our guests. They serve as a hub of information for this branch of the film industry. If you would like to learn more about the society and what it takes to get into casting, you can visit castingsociety.com. Also, if you have any questions for casting directors, let us know. I'm not going to run out of questions anytime soon, but I would love to hear from you, and I'm sure they would too. Thank you so much for listening, and as always, be well.